So I'm uh, presenting the immune therapy approaches in non-colorectal cancers, specifically we'll uh, discuss pancreatic uh, HCC and focus the majority of the discussion on some of the data in esophageal and gastric adenocarcinomas. Uh, pancreatic cancer immunotherapy, uh, and uh, from what we understand, pancreatic cancer is relatively immune privileged, and immune therapy activity observed in, with monotherapy or even combination of therapy has been minimal. Uh, additional combinational approaches are being explored right now, and f suffice it to say that for pancreas cancer, uh, the combination therapies and identifying biomarkers will be important. I think one of the interesting studies that is currently enrolling is the um, stellar study, which is the combination of uh, immune vaccines, PD-1 inhibitors, um, and the, the, in the multiple combination of stem cell inhibitors. So in HCC, the activity for anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 therapy has both been observed, and in these viral-driven tumors, uh, activity has been observed uh, irrespective of HCV or HPV status, and the current therapies explore a combination of immune checkpoint inhib inhibitors with uh, ablation and localized therapy. So, uh, here's the summary of the checkpoint blockade. Some of the trials have been recently published, and uh, Unlike uh, gastric cancer, in HCC tremolumumab, or the monoclonal antibody uh, targeting anti-CTLA-4, actually has similar activity to anti-PD-1 blockade. This is uh, the data in the volumab uh, monotherapy trial, both at the dose escalation and dose expansion cohort. The uh, activity has been seen in up to 20% of patients, which is quite impressive with the disease control rate. Uh, also, in, activity has been seen in uh, patients who were previously expo ex exposed to serafinib. Uh, so in HCC, these uh, agents are certainly hold promise, and some of the responses that are seen with HCC therapy is quite dramatic. This is uh, a patient uh, that was treated at MSKCC by my colleague, uh, Jim Harding, and uh, there's a, a, a quite um, bulky tumor with response ongoing at, uh, at one year. Um, this was a relatively dramatic response and symptomatic improvement to nivolumab. So in subset of patients, we see quite dramatic responses. Uh, the uh, checkpoint inhibitors in gastric cancer has been mostly explored uh, in, in the setting of anti-PD-1 therapy, with uh, some activity has been reported with tremolumumab and ipilimumab, uh, in, but they're, uh, they're very rare, and by a mo in most patients, no activity is seen. So as a single agent, uh, anti-CTLA-4 inhibitors are probably not worth pursuing in gastric cancer. Single agent anti-PD-1 inhibitors in unselected patients uh, generally has approximately 14 to 15% response rate in heavily pretreated population. And right now we're exploring pd one as a biomarker, although the, due to technical factors and difference in antibodies, these uh, biomarkers are still not quite uh, fully worked out. And certainly, uh, particularly because we do see uh, activity in PDL1 negative cases uh, as well. Gene expression profiles on the RNA level, but also on the DNA level, uh, hypermutation and MSI status may be a, a biomarker. And in patients that are PDL1 negative, combination therapies with nivolumab and pelumumab, um, but also in PDL1 positive patients, have been uh, shown to have promising activity with high response rate up to 26%. And the combination strategies that are currently being explored are probably the future in subsets, particularly in HER2 positive patients. Uh, the combination of uh, uh, trastuzumab and pembrolizumab has, is currently under study. So with that introduction, I'll show you some of the data. So the Attraction 2 study that was presented uh, and will soon be pu published uh, by Dr. Kang and colleagues, explored uh, the activity of nivolumab in heavily pretreated patients in third and fourth line setting, ex uh, enrolling patients in Korea, Taiwan, and Japan only. 
So this is the Asian population, 493 patients were randomized to receive nivolumab or placebo. And as you can see here, the median survivals uh, are not that different, and you would wonder why is this considered a, a positive study. But what's important about these agents and what you'll see uh, time and time again on immunotherapy trials is the hazard ratio is quite uh, impressive, 0 0.63, and it's uh, the small subset of patients that truly benefit and carry this plateau on the curve that drive the overall survival benefit and the statistical p-value. As you can see here, nivolumab monotherapy had uh, tumor reduction and uh, control in up to 37 percent of patients uh, in this heavily uh, 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 selected uh, heavily pretreated patient population unselected by PDL1 expression. So these patients were allowed to go on regardless of PDL1 status. The Checkmate 32 study looked at, uh, it was a basket study that looked at different solid tumor cohorts and esophageal and gastric adenocarcinoma patients were enrolled, 160 patients were enrolled. And this is a study that enrolled patients in six countries in Europe and America. So they were non-Asian patients. And there's this, you know, um, uh, idea through the gastric world uh, research uh, that uh, you know, Asian population of patients biologically is quite distinct than the Westerners, uh, and th therefore that's why this data is uh, interesting to highlight the differences between or the similarities between the West and the East uh, in the response to immunotherapy. So the patients were received nivolumab or a combination of nivolumab and pelumumab at two different doses with a primary endpoint of response rate. In a similar cohort of patients in, uh, or uh, type of patients in um, uh, also Western uh, patients, mostly, although Asian patients were enrolled on the study, the Keynote 059 study uh, enrolled patients with heavily pretreated disease on pembrolizumab a monotherapy, also allowing both PDL1 negative and PDL1 uh, positive tumors on. And this is a cohort one of three cohort study. You um, saw the data yesterday presented by Dan, Dan Catanacci in patients with no prior therapy in first-line pembrolizumab therapy. And the cohort one and cohort two were presented at uh, ASCO this uh, few weeks ago. And so what we are learning is that the efficacy of anti-PD-1 antibodies in Western patients is actually quite similar to the patients on, in the East. The Keno 12 Phase 1 uh, pembrolizumab study showed response rate of 22 percent, and again, it enrolled both patients in the Asia and non-Asian countries, and there wasn't a, 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 a big difference. Attraction 2 uh, is uh, the large Phase 3 nivolumab monotherapy in uh, Asian patients and the Checkmate 32 and Keynote uh, uh, 59 studies, none of them selected patients by PDL1 status, although th that status was known. And as you can see here across these studies, although the cohorts are different in size and the Checkmate 32 is the smallest cohort, uh, the, the gastric primary uh, was mostly seen in Asian population and in our population of patients in the west of GE junction and esophageal tumors, the response response rates are relatively similar. Again, highlighting that a small percent of patients benefit from anti-PD-1 therapy, but those patients, the biology of those patients are similar across East and the West. And uh, once the patients benefit, they're quite, uh, the duration of response is quite durable, and they continue on therapy with 26% uh, of patients alive at one year, which is a real game changer considering these are th third and fourth line patients. So uh, that's reassuring. And what about combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab? Do we add much? I mean, the toxicity certainly is there. Up to 26% of patients had grade three, four toxicities. Majority of them, however, are consistent of blood work abnormalities such as LFT abnormalities uh, or adrenal insufficiencies. And other toxicities such as uh, colitis and pneumonitis could have been reversed with steroids. But enhanced efficacy is seen in melanoma, but it's not clear if it actually uh, imparts survival benefit, particularly in uh, uh, combination therapy in the heavily pretreated gastric cancer patients. We know the responses are higher, 34%, uh, 24%, and up to 40% in anti-PD-L1 therapy, but we uh, really need to look at the data more carefully to understand whether or not it really imparts, if the toxicity is, is worth it. Um, we're 
we're looking at this data particularly, and there's, there may be disbalance of MSI patients across those arms, and this will be in the final publication, and this could explain the, survival uh, the, the, the lack of survival differences in the arms. But it is a more toxic regimen, so it's not probably appropriate for majority of our patients uh, that are frail in third, third and fourth line setting. But it, as immunotherapy is moving forward uh, in first and second line therapy, we may be able to consider combination therapies. Well, what about key, a combination with chemotherapy? So Keynote 59, I, you know, this was the complicated three-cohort study, looked at combination of 5-FU platinum with pembrolizumab, and this is early preliminary data. The data is not very much mature, so we can't uh, put too much stock into it. But uh, interestingly, the overall response rate uh, in the 15 patients was 60, uh, in the 25 patients was 60%. And the PDL1 positivity, uh, the responses were slightly higher, although not uh, by much. Again, highlighting that PDL1 status may not be uh, the only important biomarker uh, and may not be sufficient to enrich for patients who have the most benefit. As you can see here, at least in the small cohort of patients, there's not, um, you know, a dramatic sort of wow effect uh, for the combination of immunotherapy with pembrolizumab uh, and chemotherapy, but that data is still immature and we would have to see the overall survival. Here's the progression-free survival in co a combination of chemo plus pembrolizumab, 6.6 .6, uh, uh, months, and overall survival, 20.8 months, which is... Uh, Quite promising, I would say, but as you can see here, any of these tick marks uh, that are um, censored now, if any of these patients drop off, the survival curve will dramatically change, so we need to wait for the overall um, data maturity. Interestingly, I didn't have enough time to put those slides in, but as you, can, as you remember yesterday, Dan Catanacci presented the single agent pembrolizumab activity in uh, patients on the, that trial, and the responses were 25% in first line pembrolizumab. Uh, so we would have to wait for those data to mature to be able to give any readout whether or not chemotherapy adds anything to that combination. And this is a um, combination of VEGFR2 inhibitor, ramucirumab, which is now a standard of care in second-line setting, in combination with pembrolizumab. How does it compare in first-line patients? Uh, and as you, in, you, as you can see here, the median PFS of 5.6 months, uh, very, you know, much on par with 6.6 .6 with chemotherapy and pembrolizumab, um, and the six months PFS of 35%. Again, uh, hypothesis generating and so, certainly prov uh, provoking data, considering that uh, there was recently a press re release that rainfall met its primary endpoint for the PFS benefit in first line romosurumab. So we would have to see the data and decide in the future studies of w the best way to sequence these agents. Um, and perhaps we need to work harder at the biomarker selection. Uh, we know that uh, the PDL1 positivity rate in um, gastric cancer is quite varied, and it depends on which biomarker, which assay you use. You know, some assays test for PDL1 positivity in the tumor, some test in the tumor and the stroma, which is the Merck um, assay, and the different antibodies in the volumab study and the pembrolizumab studies make it very hard to sort of try to put this data together. Also, the different positivity cutoffs between uh, these assays uh, is, um, needs to be highlighted. Other uh, issues with PDL1 testing involves the difference in PDL1 expression at different time points in the disease with the tumor content and the stromal component and also the sample type and heterogeneity. Certainly within signet ring cell type gastric cancer, there's a lot more heterogeneity than with intestinal. So do we really need to select for PDL1 status? And this question came up uh, last uh, yesterday at a, at a session. And um, the bottom line is probably not, uh, but it would be important to um, select for these patients and continue to test them to understand how best to sequence these agents. For example, in third and fourth line setting, if there's nothing else avail available for a particular patient, uh, perhaps it, it, it's not important if we know the PDL1 L1 status. But in first line setting or second line setting, when there are a plethora of other agents right now, perhaps it's more important to at least know the PDL1 status so you can advise your patients the best. Because the responses are higher in PDL1 positive patients, um, as we can see.
see here both in the Keynote 59 and the Checkmate 32 study, and certainly in the for combination of Nevo IPI, the responses were quite uh, significant. But beyond PDL1, and I think a lot of these unfortunate uh, 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 protocols, they waste a lot of tissue doing sequential immunohistochemistry assays, while um, probably you know next generation assays multi in a multiplex fashion that we can assess both the uh, the uh, on, on, on DNA level, the MSI status, and other uh, tumor markers would be important. MSI now is considered a level one biomarker, which means that you should all test your patients probably in first line setting so that you can determine what to do with these patients in second line setting. Uh, pembrolizumab is now FDA approved uh, for uh, use in MSI high tumors irrespective of tumor origin. And uh, although within gastric cancer, MSI tumors are quite low, it's only 4%, the responses, response rates can be as high as 57% in heavily pretreated population. And these gene expression signatures uh, are interesting, but probably not prime time. This is, I wanted to share some of the internal data from uh, just a cohort of patients that I personally treated at MSKCC with immuno on immunotherapy trials. These are all comers from different immunotherapy trials, including pembrolizumab, devolumab, devolumab, and actually compassionate release. And as you can see here, you know, in hot pink, there are some responders. There are people who uh, experience both complete response and some partial responses. But there are, out of 40 patients, only five patients that had truly durable benefit that lasted uh, beyond a year. So who are these five patients? And again, this is sort of recapitulates what we, we see in published literature. What's interesting, out of these five patients, three of, out of five had high hypermutated tumors or high mutational burden tumors. So two made actual the MSI cutoff, and one patient, the best responder, treated here. He's been on therapy, as you can see here. This is a time measured in months for over 36 months. Over three years, he's been on therapy. And his tumor does not quite meet uh, the MSI cutoff, but is hypermutated, which is, again, an important factor to bring up. I think these next-gen multiplex assessment panels will be the way to identify these patients so that you give them an opportunity to, to uh, receive therapy. The second best responder is an EBV-positive patient. So Epstein-Barr virus is a rare entity but in uh, the gastric TCGA was uh, uh, seen in 9% of tumors. In, MS, in uh, metastatic uh, cases, it's quite uh, rare, but it, these patients are important to look for and assess. Um, and the, but then there's one patient that was non-MSI, non-EBV, uh, uh, you know, but still a high uh, respond, best responder. And in those cases, beyond PDL1 positivity, there's no clear biomarker. What I wanted to share with you is uh, importance, the response to first-line chemotherapy. So this is uh, survival curves by uh, mutational burden and median overall survival by in the, for patients in the high quartile rate, uh, highest top quartile, so the patients who are not necessarily just MSI. Um, they do better with the 12 months, uh, uh, the 65% uh, uh, of patients alive versus 39, and at two years, 43 versus 11 with immunotherapy. And the uh, MSI patients or hypermutated patients are shown in, in, in the blue line here. If you look at how do these patients do first-line chemotherapy, the curves are completely flipped. So majority of them progress rapidly um, on uh, in, uh, chemotherapy in first-line setting, and that's why it's so important to be ready and to know what you're going to treat them with in second line setting, so you need to identify these patients. And probably in the future, you probably you could uh, you will probably skip uh, chemotherapy in these patients altogether. These patients do live uh, longer if they receive immunotherapy, and they may need to receive it early on in first line setting. So just to summarize, you know, the uh, immune therapy non-colorectal GI cancers is a real ripe uh, area of research, and, uh, you know, we're um, pursuing other combination therapies that Giuseppe mentioned with, uh, through the Morpheus study, which, uh, you know, including cobiatezolizumab and the CA bite in uh, gastric cancer as well. A combination of targeted agents uh, needs to be explored both with remosurumab and trastuzumab as we identified so that we can select more and more patients to add to that tail on the curve because right now very few patients truly uh, benefit long term and uh, some of them are MSI so this is really important to assess.